Mitch is going to talk about cover crop cocktails. And Mitch Hunter is a PhD candidate in agronomy at Penn State University, working with David Mortensen. And uh, he's also more oriented towards ecology. I think you'll notice a common theme for those who are interested in cover crops, usually have an ecological bent to them. They're not that a traditional soil fertility person like myself. It feels appropriate for me to be coming after Matt Ryan because I actually took over his desk at Penn State. So I'm used to following in his footsteps. And I'm sure that some of the kind of intellectual juices that are flowing through this talk originated with Matthew and, and Stephen as well and other people who've come through uh, the different labs at Penn State. So many thanks to all of those folks. Um, also many thanks uh, to Charlie White. He was originally scheduled to be here. He's a SARE educator at Penn State. Um, he wasn't able to make it today, so I'm taking over for him. Um, I appreciate both the opportunity and um, all of his work because many of the slides that you'll see originated with Charlie. Um, while I'm thanking people, I want to thank uh, my research group, the Cover Crop Cocktails Project Team. Um, there's a lot of us. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We've got researchers, farmers, extension agents, um, other folks, other people in this room, including Dave Wilson. Um, so we've got a wide range of folks on our team. Uh, which really makes for a, a, a stimulating environment. And I also thank the funders at USDA and NSF. Um, but with that, I just want to dive right in and ask the question, why mixtures? Why are we talking about mixtures? And my argument is that we're interested in mixtures because mixtures can diversify the benefits that are provided by a cover crop. And I'm not saying that they can enhance the benefits. And I think that's often the, the narrative around mixtures. Um, what we've seen is that for any single benefit, biomass production, weed suppression, nitrogen supply, you can usually find a killer monoculture that can produce the maximum amount of that one benefit. And so going to a mixture isn't necessarily going to give you more. Um, you may even dilute out that one killer monoculture species. But when you go to a mixture, you can diversify the number of benefits that you get um, out of your cover crop stand. So it can let you do more things with your cover crop. And just to illustrate that, um, I'll introduce this tool that we use for quantifying cover crop benefits. It's called a spider plot. And you can see there are six vectors around the outside, yield, weed control, nitrogen retention, etc. And we score these cover crop treatments based on how they perform, and that shows how far out that vector um, they go. And then you just connect the dots around the outside, and you get your shape. So this is uh, one way that we use to quantify different multifunctional benefits from cover crops. Um, and so to put some examples up there, here's what we've seen. This is just one year of data. But this illustrates the difference between a rye cover crop and a pea cover crop. And you can see they're almost entirely different. So the rye excelled in adding organic matter to the soil. It excelled in weed control and nitrogen retention, where the pea was essentially the opposite, did great for the yield of the following corn crop, did great for supplying nitrogen, but not much else. So then the question becomes, what happens when you layer these two together, if you make a mix that includes rye and pea, um, do you get enhanced benefits? Do you get diversified benefits? What happens? And what we've seen, um, so this is real data. It's a three species mix, um, but rye and pea are the main components. What we've seen is that you really um, diversify more than enhance. You can see that the blue shape that represents the mixture doesn't go a lot further out on any of those vectors than the two monocultures. Um, but what it does do is it's a broader shape. It takes in some of those yield benefits, some of the nitrogen supply benefits, while still getting the weed control and the organic matter addition and all of the good things from the rye. So again, by putting these two together in a mixture, we've been able to diversify the benefits even if we haven't greatly enhanced um, any particular one of them. I just want to pause for a second and think about what we've learned from cover cropping mixtures research and what we've learned from cover cropping mixtures practice. So they're usually pretty different. Um, so if we think about like the leading lights of mixtures in practice, you have folks like Gabe Brown in North Dakota, you have folks like Dave Brandt in Ohio, and you have the ultimate prophet of cover crop mixtures, Ray Archuleta. And <laughs> these guys are really leading the way and driving a lot of the excitement around soil health and specifically cover crop mixtures. And Ray's even famous for Ray's Crazy Mix, which has dozens and dozens of species in it. And so for me, this raises the question, are researchers crazy? And I think the answer is usually that we're not crazy enough. Um, we work with much simpler systems than what's being done on farms and then what I think is driving a lot of excitement around cover crop mixtures and soil health. 
And so we are the reductionists trying to understand how it all works. Um, and so we end up working with a simplified system. Uh, we're focusing on measurable benefits and soil health. Uh, as Brandon laid out earlier, our ability to measure that is still developing. We don't have a test, one test you can go take and get a good sense of soil health like this. Um, so we focus on the things that we can measure. We're interested in determining, determining costs and benefits and trade-offs. Um, and that's more easily done when you're working with a limited number of species, maybe from two to eight. Um, but I kind of feel bad as a researcher. I don't want to be discouraging folks from going crazy and having fun with cover crops because I think that's a lot of what's making them so successful. Um, so just as a, a way to think about this, as you're seeing results about mixtures that are maybe two species or five species, and you're trying to see how does this relate to a much more diverse mix, one way to think about it is just to take um, the results of a research mix and treat the species that are involved as functional groups. So if we include cereal rye, you could consider what it would be like if we had three or four different cereal grains, and the, the response might be similar um, within the context of a mixture that has a lot more species in it. So that's just a little bit of context to try to put this next to some of the things that are happening out on farms. So with that, I've got the five steps to success in using cover crop mixtures. Um, the first is to understand your context, then to identify your goals, select complementary species, follow the basic agronomic fundamentals of planting those mixtures, and then finally to farm tune your mix. And I should put a little trademark next to farm tune. We do have that patented now at Penn State. Uh, we actually <laughs> got a grant about farm tuning. So anytime you use that, please attribute it to us. No, I'm just totally kidding. Um, <laughs> but that's what we're working on next. I want to emphasize that context is critical. And context is critical because you can't have a successful mix without understanding your context. So it's a challenge. It challenges us. But the best way, or one, one very good way to understand your context is to plant a mix. So you plant it out there, you see what happens, and you've learned a lot about your climate and your soils and how different species respond. Um, so just to illustrate this quickly, and we'll come back to it, here's the same four species mix planted in the same year on different farms. So one of our collaborating farms in Berks County, PA, um, ended up with a mix that had a lot of cereal rye, a decent amount of canola, um, and very little legume biomass. And then not too far away, on a farm in Montour County, you had the exact same mixture planted, same seeding rate, same year, totally different results. You have almost a quarter of the biomass from pea. You have canola dominance, not cereal rye. Um, so this, I think, really brings home that when you're putting out a diverse mix, and you've got all these dynamics of response to soil, response to climate, and competition within the mix, that your context is really critical. And just, you know, a little bit of context about these specific farms. In Berks County, this farmer um, is down the road from a pig farm. He's got all the free manure that he can handle. So he's got very high nitrogen and organic matter in his soils. Um, hence, very little legume biomass. Um, and the rye did quite well. Um, in the Montour County farm, that's much more nutrient limited. You can see the pea responded to that. And then he also planted way earlier. So he had a much longer growing season. And we've seen that that helps the canola out uh, relative to the rye. So again, the first step is to understand your context. Some of the key questions, what's your climate, what's your soil, your planting window, your previous cash crop, your following cash crop, um, you know, the weather of that particular year, the budget that you're working with, what kind of planting equipment do you have? There's just a lot that needs to be considered. So just to get you in the mindset, take a second and think about what are some of the key points of context on your farm or the farms that you work with in your region that might be influencing these mixtures. Now that you've got a sense of your context, the next step is to identify your goals. And I say your diverse goals because remember, if we're trying to plant mixtures, if we want to plant mixtures, it's because we want to diversify the benefits that we're getting out of our cover crops. Um, so we've got a whole list here. Everybody's familiar with the different things that cover crops can do for us. Which of those are going to be most critical for you? And to me, one of the critical parts of this, one of the most important goals to, to focus on is picking a carbon to nitrogen ratio. And using a mixture gives you a lot of flexibility to shoot for different C to N ratios. Um, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with the C to N ratio. Essentially, um, the more N in your cover crop biomass, the more N is going to be supplied to your cash crop. And it gets a lot more complex than that, but that's a good starting point. Um, and I think to me, this is the question of, what kind of cocktail are you going out for? 
You know, are you looking for like a really zippy cocktail, like a Red Bull mixer? Um, or maybe something that's going to hit you a little slower, like some Guinness. In the cover cropping context, the C to N ratio sets the parameters of what you're going to plant, which species, and when you're going to terminate them in terms of what level of maturity you're going to let them get to. So this is a little bit tricky if you haven't spent a lot of time in the lab analyzing plant samples from your cover crop mixtures. Um, but one way to think about it that's a little easier is if you use the dominant species in your mix as kind of an indicator of where you fall out. Um, oh, I ju jumped ahead of myself. Why is C to N ratio so important? I think people have a good sense. Um, why do we want to pick a target C to N ratio? Uh, this is some, some results from my colleague Denise Finney from a, another project that she worked on. And across the bottom you have the C to N ratio. And you can see here that for corn following those cover crops, the relative yield is much higher at low C to N ratio. So those are probably treatments that are either legume monocultures or include a lot of legumes. And so you might be saying, great, I know my target C to N ratio, it's 10, it's 15, that's going to give me a good corn yield. Um, but at the same time, uh, you get a different relationship with some of the other services we want from cover crops. So here at the low C to N ratio, you have lots of treatments that did a bad job of suppressing weeds. Um, and maybe even more important, especially in the Chesapeake Bay region, uh, you have lots of treatments down there at low C to N that lost a lot of nitrogen to leaching out the bottom of the soil profile over the winter. So um, your target C to N ratio is really going to be dependent on what kind of system you're in. If you have abundant free hog manure, you might be looking to the higher C to N ratio species or mixtures um, to help you tie up some of that N and keep it, um, keep it in place, not lose it, keep it for your crop. So um, now that you have a, a, some sense of maybe in your context what C to N ratio you want, let's use some indicator species or example species to help us understand what to shoot for. Um, so these are just what we've seen as ranges within our own work. Um, the clovers and peas are down around 10 to 15. Uh, radish and canola are low if they're immature and then they can range up, especially canola can range up to maybe 30 to one. Um, and the grasses can, can be very high up there. If they're, if they're very immature, they're low, but they quickly um, get to have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this means if you're thinking of a target C to N for your mix on the very low end, it better be mostly legumes. Um, or somehow if you've got some very immature um, plants from other functional groups in there too, that could work. Um, if you're looking for something more in the middle, uh, you can use some of the species indicated there, canola, some of the grasses, or you can do a mix. If you've got a lot of legume biomass and some mature grasses, that can even out towards somewhere in the middle. Uh, again, if you're trying to tie up as much nitrogen as possible, get a lot of crops out there that are going to get pretty woody, um, that are going to be very mature, allowed to mature later. Um, and so when you're thinking about your cover crop mix, think about how you average the species that are in it together, as well as the maturity. And so in case I haven't been clear, the farther out to the right that you go, um, is th those are going to be the more mature plants. Uh, as the plants mature, the carbon to nitrogen ratio generally increases, especially in non-legumes. Okay, so we've got a sense of the C to N ratio that we're targeting. Um, now we need to think about how are we going to get a good stand in a mix? Um, how do we maximize biomass uh, with the caveat that we don't want to go off the deep end of the C to N ratio? And we're thinking about this because a lot of services are proportional to biomass. Nitrogen retention, nitrogen supply, Weed suppression, and I have an example there in the pictures where on the left, you got a lot of biomass in the canola, um, very few weeds, and then on the right of that, you have red clover with low biomass and is just totally invaded with weeds. Um, of course, erosion control and soil organic matter additions, these are all related to biomass. And one approach to getting the biomass that you want is to shoot for complementary species to put together in your mix. Um, and there's a number of ways that species can be complementary. So um, one is that they can have complementary growth periods. Uh, we heard earlier about harvesting sunlight. Well, if you're just planting a winter hardy cover crop that grows slowly in the winter, you're not going to be using a lot of that sunlight in that time frame. So you can add a winter killed cover crop, um, a radish or an oat that's going to ra grow rapidly in the fall, take in a lot of that sunlight energy, um, and then that will senesce and create space for the winter hardy cover crop the next spring. Um, I don't think I need to go through these lists, but there are uh, a number of, a number of options out there for both winter-killed cover crops and winter-hardy cover crops that you can 
find in the different guides. Um, so another way to be complementary is to have complementary, oh, I'm sorry. Another example of these complementary growth periods is, um, for instance, a mix with sorghum sudan grass, annual ryegrass, and crimson clover. And so on the left, you can see that um, this is that mix in the fall. It's the, the sudan grass has just been mowed off, but you see that one strip where you have a huge amount of biomass. Now in that space where it's been mowed, the following spring, you have an opportunity where the ryegrass and the crimson clover can fill back in, um, take advantage of the resources that are available in the spring, and between the two really um, produce a lot of biomass. Another example of complementarity is complementary maturation. And anybody who's worked with cereal rye knows that you can be out there and blink and all of a sudden it's you know, heading out. So um, that's tricky when you're trying to sync that up with legume maturity. Uh, an alternative is to use something like triticale or annual ryegrass that matures more slowly. Um, and here's an example of where you've got triticale and hairy vetch together. Now this is probably more biomass than most people are going to go for, um, depending on your system, but you can see that they're both flowering at the same time. So developmentally, they're going to be synced up throughout that spring window. Um, another pair that works well together as far as complementarity is annual ryegrass and crimson clover. Okay, so another way to be complementary is in your growth form. And so one thing you can think about is mixing tall open species with low dense species and vining species and you can kind of fill up that whole vertical volume space in your canopy. Um, you just need to be sure to not plant any of the species too densely. Here we can see on the right, um, sun hemp that's planted pretty, in a pretty open way, um, has a thriving understory underneath it. Um, and here's an example of having a, a mix with some overstory sunflowers, and it's a little hard to see, but there are radishes and vetch mixed in there as well. You can see really filling up that space in the canopy. However, if you go too far on your seeding rate, um, you know, 30 pounds to the acre of sorghum sedan, and also want to have some understory, um, you might have gone too dense. In this case, it was far too dense. The flip side of this is if you lack complementarity, you increase competition between the species. So uh, an example of a red clover monoculture, and then if you add in annual ryegrass, those two are pretty much occupying the same space in the canopy. The ryegrass simply outcompeted the red clover, and you didn't really get an enhancement in resource use or biomass or the amount of the canopy that was being filled up. Probably the classic example of complementarity and the, the cover crop mix that's been used most often is the grass legume mix. And here, obviously, you have your nitrogen fixer, fixer and your nitrogen scavenger there together. Um, so that works well. But you can go a little bit beyond that too, um, potentially adding in a radish along with those. Um, here you've got an end fixer. You've got the oats with the fibrous, fibrous root system that's probably going to be concentrated in the upper soil layers. And then you have the forage radish that's going to be accessing some of the deeper soil layers as well. So another way of being complementary. Or complementary. Now I've been focusing mostly on the biomass and how to get a good quantity of biomass from your mixes. But you can also add targeted species to get specific benefits. Um, so a really clear example of that is if you add species that will go to flower, uh, you can provide resources for pollinators. Um, you can alleviate compaction by including forage radishes. Uh, you can get higher quality forage if you choose annual ryegrass or triticale to be the grass in your mix instead of maybe something like rye that's going to become very woody very quickly. Um, and then the question is, how much of these species do you need to get the benefit? And I think in most cases, when you add these species to a mix, their benefit is going to be diluted. So we've seen um, in our work with canola that bee visitation is pretty much directly related to the number of flowers. So if you, if you have a mix, the canola gets diluted, you have fewer flowers, you're provisioning fewer bees. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. The other flip side of it is that by adding in these species, again, you're diversifying the benefits you're getting, you're broadening it out, and then it's up to you to decide, well, what proportions of different functions do I value on my farm, what's important in my context, and with my goals. Okay, so how do we actually get these cover crop mixtures established in the field? Um, one of the challenges is getting the right seeding depth. And the simplest way to do this is to just mix the species, mix the seeds together, and shoot for a middle depth, maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch. Um, but this sometimes leads to poor stands, especially the smaller seeded uh, species that would really rather be much shallower, have trouble germinating in this context. Um, so the best management practice is to separate the seeds by size into different drill boxes. So if your drill is set up with a large and a small seed boxes, 
then you can easily get those seeds where they need to be, maybe just dribbling the smaller seeds on the surface. However, you do need to have the right equipment to make this happen. So if that's not how you're set up, um, there are some more options. Uh, you can make separate trips with the same drill, or you can make separate trips by drilling and then coming back and broadcasting and cultipacking the smaller seeded uh, species on the top of the soil. One issue that sometimes comes up with these mixes is seed settling and separating. Once you mix all these together, do they stay in that same proportion within your seed bins? Um, and experience shows that this is rarely a problem. The worst case is when you have large round seeds and small round seeds together. Um, but if you have a more diverse mix of seed sizes, especially if you have some nice long um, grass seeds mixed in there, that pack should stay relatively stable and you shouldn't have to worry too much about settling. Another thing you can do to enhance the establishment of mixes is select a different row configuration. Um, and this can allow uh, both species or multiple species to get established while including a really aggressive species like the radish. So that's what's happening here. You have radish and hairy vetch in alternating rows. Um, if they were all mixed together, the radish might shade out the vetch. You can see there in November just how vigorous those were. Um, but because the, the vetch was able to get established in its own row, it's still going to be there in the spring um, to do its thing after the radish has senesced. Um, another example, you can do the same uh, strategy with radish and rye. And then in the following spring, you have these strips um, that might make it easier to manage the cover crop biomass. Or if you're really creative, you might be able to come up with a way to plant into those open strips where the radishes were. They'll be warmer. Um, there won't be residue to deal with. So lots of interesting opportunities to play around with there. How do you get these uh, split rows if you're, you know, don't have a um, split row planner? Um, you can just put baffles or cover over the, the holes in um, your two different seed boxes if you have that. Or if you just have one seed box, you can put cardboard baffles in so you create separate little seed compartments. Um, again, if you have a split row planner, it's a lot easier. Matt gave us an incredible rundown on choosing seeding rates in general, and I think all the complexity that he talked about is embedded in doing this with mixtures as well. So really the best management practice is to try it and see how it works. And if you're at all risk averse, maybe start out on a small acreage, um, see what happens and then adjust. But in general, um, for a grass legume mix, it's a good idea to reduce the grass seeding rate to between a half and a quarter of what the monoculture rate typically is. And from my experience, I would say a quarter uh, if you want to have any kind of C to N ratio that's on the lower end. Um, well, at the same time, you keep the legume rates up near their monoculture rates. It's just a, com a difference in competitive ability. Um, and then you really need to limit the seeding rates for highly competitive species, especially if you're not separating them spatially. So keep the forage radish low, the canola low, sorghum sedan and oats. Uh, if you go too high on those, they're really going to take over your mix. Um, and I would include rye in that list as well, it's just not up there. Um, now, how do you account for redundancy if you have a, a highly diverse mix? How do you adjust your seeding rate? And so when we say, we say that when species are similar in their growth form, growth period, nutrient acquisition strategy, if they're the same functional group, basically, you take what you would expect to seed one of those at, and then you just divide it by the number of species. So if you're going to seed cereal rye at a 3x rate, and you want to do rye, barley, and wheat, you just seed all of them at 1x. Um, but for those in particular, making sure to keep them quite low. Um, OK, so you've planted a diverse cover crop mixture. What are you going to get? I want to see a show of hands. Who thinks that you're going to get basically the same proportion as the seeds that you put out there? Good. All right, you guys are paying attention. Um, so one thing that mixes can do is that they can adapt to different soil fertility levels. Again, this is that same four species mixture, rye, winter pea, canola, and red clover. On the left, that's our research site. On the right, that's an on-farm site. And they look totally different. Um, so to give you some more insight into what's happening here, um, which I foreshadowed earlier, um, what we have is a gradient from short season to long season. And on the short season side, we had rye dominance. Um, where on the longer season side, we had canola dominance. Same seeding rate, same year. Um, and I think what we're seeing there is that rye grows to a certain degree and then it waits to get vernalized before it does anything else. Where the canola just will keep going. If it's got growing degree days, it'll keep going. Um, and so it was really able to outcompete the rye in those contexts where it had a longer growing season. Now that's crossed with also the nitrogen um, availability. So again, the research station, low nitrogen availability. You see some decent amount of legume production. 
on that third farm, you have a high amount of legume production. But then the two in the middle have very high um, soil nitrogen. The one has the free hog manure. The other one applies high rates of mushroom compost, and you just see almost no legume production on those farms. You can't just take a recommendation out of a seed catalog um, and put it on your farm and expect to get the kind of mix that you necessarily want. You definitely want to talk to your neighbors, um, talk to experts who've seen the way these mixtures perform in different contexts to find out how yours might shake out. And so we call this farm tuning your cover crop mixtures. How do you account for your soils, your climate, the space in your rotation, your planting window, etc., cetera, um, to design a mix that's going to give you the functions that you're looking for? And this is the next iteration of our project. We're really emphasizing the on-farm side, and you can see we have kind of a hub and spoke system set up around um, Pennsylvania and New York. Not as broad as Matt's project, but it does cover a wide range of kind of climate soil space. And we hope we're going to plant the same five species mix in all these places. And we hope this will really give us a sense of how some of these key context variables really affect how your mixture turns out. All right, so some conclusions, um, just to kind of recap for you. Uh, research is confirming, um, I think, what farmers are seeing that uh, planting mixtures has benefits, and the benefits that we're seeing are that they can really diversify um, what you're getting out of your cover crops as compared to using monocultures. Um, and to, to recap the five steps to success, you want to know your context, um, you want to identify your goals, and picking a target C to N ratio is really critical. Um, select complementary species in, in the various ways that I discussed. Get your seeds in well. I've heard a lot of people say you got to treat your cover crop like a crop, like a cash crop. You don't want to just throw it out there, but make sure that you're following good agronomics to get it planted. And then farm tune the mix. So really there should be a loop back up to number one, because there's no better way to understand your context in my mind than putting these mixtures out there and seeing what happens. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, please contact us if you have any uh, any more questions. Thanks. With the, your your study, you're showing that there's grasses that are growing more so in a fertility, a high fertility compared to a low fertility. Could this be like a uh, an indicator? I mean, can you use this as an indicator for like the following season, saying, all right, hey, you've got this high fertility. Can you cut back a certain amount? Because you've got this growing in this mixture, your legumes aren't growing as much, or if you've got low fertility, you're higher legumes? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it definitely is an indicator. I would hesitate to tell somebody to make a big management change off of one year um, because climate can have a, such a large effect as well. But I think this is the sort of thing of understanding your context better. If you note that in a certain field, um, your legumes just never show up, you've got great growth from grasses and brassicas, that might be a, a good indicator that that field does need a little bit less fertility. Um, it also is a, points to one of the benefits of mixtures that in this process of figuring things out, they're kind of giving you the service that you need. So if you have a lot of extra nitrogen in that particular field, um, you probably need more nitrogen retention than you do fixation. And by virtue of putting the mixture out there, you're probably going to get a little bit more of what you need than if you just guessed on a particular monoculture that you chose to plant. Have you ever taken a, um, I mean, I know you did here a little bit, you took different planting dates, but did you ever do that in one field that you had the species that would actually qualify for a month planting window and plant every week and, and then capture the differences? Uh, we haven't done that. We, that's part of our next project. We've got a you know, some side research space that we're going to do more of a factorial approach like that. And then we'll also have kind of the natural variability from the many different farms. But yeah, I think that is a, a, a critical um, point. We, we actually did, in a way, plant the same mixtures in August and then in late September. Um, so it's too big of a window to really get a nuanced view, but it's clear that the effects of planting date on a mix are dramatic. Um, when you planted it that late, all you got was rye where we are. So. Um, and somewhere intermediate, I think you would have seen some other species being recruited into that mix, like canola, maybe uh, winter pea, depending on the winter, that kind of thing. So that's a good question. Yeah, I've done it, and uh, I agree. Okay. Every week, same mix, it changes every week. I think you got good job security. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Do you have any experience with herbicide residuals? Are you seeing the effects of herbicide residuals related to the active ingredients and the uh, different weather patterns that we're seeing, for example, with uh, drier periods, 
wet periods and dry periods? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I personally don't. Um, the system I'm working in is organic, but um, Bill Curran and Dwight Lingenfelter and John Wallace at Penn State have done a lot of really intensive work on this. So if you Google Bill Curran cover crop, you know, herbicide, something like that, you'll find a lot of information at least relevant to the Pennsylvania region. I noticed he has some sunflowers in there and other, if you experiment with other legumes like uh, lentils and other things, or you really keep it simple just to have better accurate uh, measurements? Yeah, um, we have mostly kept it simple. Um, so on my project, we just had six species, two grasses, two legumes, two brassicas. Um, the other data that I showed went a little bit broader. They did throw in sun hemp um, and I think another, uh, maybe fava bean. Um, so there are, there are more options out there for sure, um, and some of them may be right for a particular window, um, but my research hasn't gone that crazy yet, so uh, I, don't, I can't speak to it specifically. So, so here's a crazy thing to do. Um, have you ever thought about using what's already out there as a cover crop, like the weeds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're actually kind of starting up uh, some conversations about maybe a paper thinking about what that would look like. Um, and as, as Matt pointed out, you know, um, sometimes weeds can act as a little nurse crop. Um, and I think the viability of that really depends on what kind of system you're in. Um, for us, uh, my project, an organic system, uh, the little bit of weed contribution from a cover crop window is nothing compared to if you have a little uh, challenge with cultivation in the spring and what you can get in your cash crops. So for us, it really might not be that big of a deal. If you're in a system where you absolutely have to have clean fields all the time, um, because that's your preference or that's what works agronomically, um, then you might not want to enable those weeds to express and set additional seeds and that kind of thing. But um, Charlie, uh, who was supposed to be here today, in his, some of his on-farm work, he saw weeds playing, a, kind of filling a gap that clover was failing to fill. Um, when the clover wasn't very weedy, uh, he saw a lot of leaching underneath it. But when he had weed infested clover plots, there was almost no leaching. Um, there was maybe a little more weed seed production than you'd want on those plots. But there might be a sweet spot there where the weeds can make up for the deficiencies in a legume as far as keeping nitrogen around and not be too big of a, an issue in terms of weed management. So, great question.